Even Paul struggled with doing God's will. Look at Romans 7, where he says, What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then act another. And I, I uh, looked at uh, Romans 7 in the message, and I just want to read uh, Romans seven fourteen through 25 here, just this narrative that, he, that he's talking about. He says, I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand myself by, about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but I still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps me sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in action. Some, something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. I thought that was a great translation uh, or, or, or interpretation of that verse through the message. The narrative we find in Hosea chapter 2, our verses uh, for today, lays out this type of waffling between two behaviors. Sin is a powerful trap. And while my sin may not be a trap for you, your sin is. I'll say that again. Sin is a powerful trap. And while my sin may not be a trap for you, your sin is. Okay? So, Hosea 2, kind of finishing up uh, before we begin again, starts off with saying unto your brethren and me and to your sisters, uh, Ruhama. And, and, you know, we finished up last week talking about the fact that, you know, God has said, you're not my people, there is no mercy, and then comes back and says, but there's, you're going to be in the, in the place where the seed was planted, you're going to be my people, and there will be mercy. And um, so it, it sounds like, you know, somehow God's waffling, and that's not the case here. So when it, when it comes back here in, in uh, chapter 2 and says, you're going to say, that you, you know, you are my people and there is mercy. That's kind of finishing it up. And so what's in a name? Well, we talked about that. It's, it's the idea of Jezreel is, is, you know, where God has planted seed and, and, and that, uh, it's, that there's going to be mercy and there's going to be a restoration that's going to be my people, okay? Um, and God isn't confused in this. It, it, you know, speaking through, who's, uh, through Hosea, he says, you know, it's, it's plead with your mother, talking about Gomer, plead with your mother, plead for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her, bless you, and her adulteries from between her breasts. And um, so he's, he's saying, look, she's, she's often in the whoredom. This whole process is, is wrong. And as I said, you know, when we look at this, we're looking at not only the literal story that uh, is told in Hosea, but we're looking at the, 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 uh, the shadows of our own relationship with God. We walk, we walk out 
of our proper relationship with God and go off and do our own thing. And it's, you know, the, I don't want to read the entire chapter because it's just too much to, to read for today. But I want to cover the content of, of the chapter. And so he, he talks about the actions and, and basically stripping her down naked and, and taking her through embarrassment for her for behavior and all of these things. And, and if we look at it, how God deals with us, we can get confused. God isn't confused. He's not waffling about whether to show you mercy. He's not waffling about whether you're his people or not. You are. He paid, he paid the price for your sin. You're the one who's waffling, not God. Though we may not understand... Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing, and we say, well, you know, this is difficult. And, and i give you an example. You know, have you heard people say, how could a loving God, and then you can fill in the blank, right? How could a loving God send someone to hell? How could anyone be so stupid as not to choose salvation? That's the better question. How could a loving God allow someone to suffer with cancer. Well, we could go through the whole process of how could a loving God, he set up the rules. And, and, and when you break the rules, there's consequences for those things. And I guess the best example I can think of uh, quickly off the top of my head is gravity. Why did God allow the plane to crash? Well, let's back up. God created a law of gravity when he set up the earth. Man built an airplane that goes up and defies the law of gravity until it doesn't. And then it comes crashing down to the earth. And you say, how did God allow that? No, God was consistent. His law was consistent. If he had intervened and the plane hadn't crashed miraculously had been able to defy gravity we would call that a miracle but just because you don't get a miracle every single time doesn't mean that God's inconsistent or he's not loving okay though we may not understand we have to stop and 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 really look at these things and understand that God is looking from a completely different perspective from a much higher elevation if you will he sees things differently than you or I. We're in the middle of the forest. You know, you see the, these, these uh, videos where they pan away from the earth, you know? And it's, it's amazing how different it all looks when you start changing that perspective, right? Understand this. Pain is a teacher. Sometimes... Sometimes we don't learn without a little bit of pain, right? We just don't get it. There's all kinds of examples of how that works in the, in the, the world, right? I mean, look at boxers. They have sparring partners to do what? Hit them and get hit by them. You know, it's painful for both of them, but it's, it's to, to learn something. You know, football, they, they train pretty hard. Our military, they train very hard. They push, push the limits of your mind and your body. Why? So that when you encounter that life or death situation, you can perform above what normal people can do. Pain is a teacher. You've heard no pain, no gain, right? Pain is a teacher. And what God is saying, you know, through the story of Hosea here in chapter 2 is, look, there's going to be some pain. That's going to happen because we have to reach this place where I come to recognize my, the state that I'm in, exactly where I'm at. And, and verse 4 says, I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, 
I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. I'm going to go I'm going to go to those things that I know are incorrect, I know are wrong, that I know are sinful, because that's the source of all this stuff I need. Okay? Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and take, make a wall that she may not find her path. So God's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to do something about this, and it's going to be frustrating, and you're going to be blocked. Okay? And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She'll seek them, but she'll not find them. Then shall she, then shall she say, try saying that three times fast. Um, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. In other words, the pain will, and frustration will get to a point where she'll go, you know what, I, this has got to change. I, I was better off before. The recognition that, you know, this isn't working. That's one of our problems is sometimes we don't recognize this isn't working. It's comfortable, it's familiar, so it must be right. It's not working. Okay? And then verse 8 is really important. It says, For she, should, she did not know that I gave her her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepare for Baal. The, okay? God is the source. And like I said, you, you learn sometimes through pain. I've told the story many times of my experience with uh, trying to unstick a log with my dad. And um, the punchline to that one is, you know, we both, we both went tumbling down the hill, him first, me second. And he said, now, I learned something when I rolled down the hill, did you? Okay. Pain is a teacher. My dad was a teacher, too, because uh, I didn't learn anything rolling down the hill. But, <laughs> but he did, <laughs> and he shared it with me. Sometimes it's difficult to let failure teach the ones that you love. I could intervene. I could step in. I could make a difference. I was I was reading a, a little bio on uh, Ken Norton, and some of you may know who that is, but he was a boxer. And um, he actually uh, was a Marine. His, his son played football for the 49ers. But Ken Norton was failing financially and failing as a boxer, failing, fa well, I mean, he was okay as a boxer, but he wasn't getting paid very much. And he was, he was at the point where he just, he couldn't make it anymore. And so he called his dad and asked for help. And his dad said, Ken, if I help you, you'll never succeed. You need to go get it done. You need to go figure it out. That was hard for him to hear. I'll go to dad. He'll fix it. No, I'm not going to fix it because that won't fix the problem. See, letting failure teach those you love is difficult. But the story of what happened after that is that he had a few more fights, and then he fought Muhammad Ali, and then he got a massive payout, and then he succeeded financially. Because he persevered and, 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 and went through. But think about his dad. He comes to him and says, I need your help. Well, our kids come, I need your help. It's hard to say, you know what? You're going to you're gonna have to fail a little bit here to learn something. Because if I just bail you out, you're never going to learn. And sometimes God allows things to happen because we need to reach that point where we realize that it's my, I'm not succeeding at what I'm doing. I'm not working. I have to, something has to change. Then it's not that, well, apparently I've got to do it all on my own. No, it's, it's recognizing I need to let God have his way in my life. I need, to, I need to pursue God instead of things. I need to pursue God instead of my own ideals. Does that make sense? 
Oh, I know we don't like to hear that stuff. Nobody likes to hear that, you know, your plan isn't the best one, right? Nobody likes to hear correction, really, you know? And, and yet the Bible, all the way through, talks about God's correction, God's guidance, how he leads us through. You know, the 23rd Psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's talking about God's guidance and, and correction. And he says, they comfort me. Well, how's that? Because I know that he's there working on my behalf with my best interest, and I just need to trust him. See, blessings come from God. Blessings don't come from how smart you are. How smart you are comes from God. Blessings don't come from how well you sing. Your voice and ability to sing come from God. Your financial success and prowess in the stock market doesn't come from how smart you are about stocks. It comes from God. Right? And sometimes... God allows those things to not work out for you so you can recognize that it isn't all about you. There's nothing worse than somebody who thinks it's all about them. Look what I've done. I'm a genius. Right? That's what it is. I'm a genius. I am so smart. I always think I always said it was Calvin and Hobbes, and and Calvin's like, he's, that's he, I'm I'm a genius. I'm so smart. And Hobbes goes, "Hey, genius, you tied your shoes together." <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm. That's you know that's the that's the reality. But it can be in all kinds of things. You know, I I I, I could pick on Pastor because because he would allow me to do so but i mean he's so talented musically and we all talk about pastor you are so talented musically oh my goodness you are so talented musically and he is but you know what sometimes he makes mistakes and so if he's sitting there if he's sitting there thinking i am all that in a bag of potato chips and right about then he hits a wrong chord and forgets the melody line ah you know it gets it gets it gets humbling really quick doesn't it <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> but, but see, here's the thing. We, we get to the place where my sin is a comfort. I get comfortable in what I've got going on. So even though it's not right, you know, if God's not like pounding me over the head about it, it's like, man, eh, you know, it must be okay. I could, I could just do this. And we can justify it, Right. You know, I got to make some money here, so it's it's okay if I, you know, practice a little whoredom instead of, you know, staying with my husband and, and relying on my husband, right, or, or God, in, as the analogy would be. So I can get caught in that. And sometimes we can even get uh, sort of prideful about it, you know. Well, that's just how I am. I, I'm just, it, you know, it, it's the way, it's product of my childhood, or it's product of this, or it's what, it, it's because of this, or it's because of this. But, but it feels comfortable. It's, it's, it's not that I enjoy it. It's that I am not comfortable stepping outside of that. Yeah. So I'm enslaved by my sin. I want to do something different, but I end up doing what I didn't intend to do. Because it was easy. It was comfortable. No, God did not call us to be comfortable. So we need to stop worshiping failure. I can give you my testimony of failure forever. It's great that you have a testimony. What's, what are you testifying to? God or your failure? Right? We, we need to stop 
looking at all those things. You know, the devil's after me again. It's horrible again. This is happening again. This is bad again. And, oh, we get sympathy. Oh, I'll pray for you. Oh, that's, that's horrible. And I'm not saying you should never profess that you have a struggle. I'm not saying that. But be careful that you don't get locked into that idea that this is my identity. You know, it's a victim, victimization identity or whatever, you know. So I, I get locked into that instead of looking to God to take me out of that place instead, take me out of my, because God will take you out of your comfort zone. Right? Even, even David, when he, when he slew Goliath, you know, he, could, he was able to say, you know, hey, I, I beat the bear, I beat the lion, right? God could have said, hey, take on another bear. Okay, I've done that. I'm good. I'm comfortable with that. I'll just be known as the lion killer, you know? But he said, no, go take on Goliath. That's a little outside my comfort zone. At least it's outside my comfort zone, right? You mean that 14-foot tall guy over there? Is that the one you were referring to? Don't see him. <laughs> Can't hear you. <laughs> so, God, I want to be used by you. Okay, well, I have a prophetic word I want you to give. Out loud? <laughs> to people? <laughs> I was kind of... I was kind of okay prophesying to the cat, but this is not this is not so good now, God. Are you sure? I want you to pray for that sick person over there. Me? I might get sick. <laughs> I don't even know them very well. You know, God takes us out of our comfort zone. Why? Because because He sees us in a completely different light, in a completely different perspective. And so he can say, you know what, all this stuff is going to happen. You're going to suffer all this stuff. Why? Because he loves us so much to allow that to happen. But it's, it's when we get in that state of misery that we recognize our problem. I mean, you know, if you've gone through any of the 12-step the programs, they always talk about you have to hit bottom. Well, why do they say that? Because it's true? Because until you hit bottom, you keep thinking you can do it yourself. When you hit bottom, you go, I, there's no hope for me except God. Right? See, the big picture, suffering doesn't make you saintly. No. And I'm just saying, it doesn't. Suffering doesn't make you saintly. So why are you doing it? Why are you suffering? You say, well, I don't have control over all the things that come at me. No, you don't. But you have control over how you deal with them. And how you deal with them is you give them to God and you trust God and you have faith in God and you have confidence in God and you don't keep running back to doing it on your own. Bragging doesn't make you right. Okay? Give God the credit. Give God the glory. Right? Bragging about your sin doesn't make you more saintly either, just so you know, right? Give it to God. You know, you've heard suffer in silence, and I'm not trying to tell you, you know, to shut up. That's not it at all. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is we, we need to look at what it is we have going on and recognize from where our help actually comes from. Recognize all the things that God does for us that we don't even necessarily see. That's what Hosea is saying about Gomer. Right? I'm going to go return to all the things that got me, you know, success financially and all those things before. And he's like, well, no, I'm going to block those paths. Those aren't going to happen. And I was the source of all those things to begin with. I've said this a lot of times, particularly to my kids. <clears throat> Don't believe your own press releases. Okay? We do this. Right? We tell the story so we're the hero. You know what I'm talking about. Right? Yeah, that's a press release. I wouldn't believe it. That person doesn't exist at your house at 2 a.m. Right? They're not there. We all have problems. We all have things. But our number one problem is when we stop turning to God. 
Our number one problem is when we stop giving it to God. Our number one problem is when we start trying to figure it out. We start trying to think it out. We start trying to go, well, this worked for me before. I'll do, I'll do what worked for me before. I, you know, it really worked well for me when I, when I uh, you know, went to the gym for, for uh, a half an hour on my way to work. That really, that, that made it, that's what made my life work. The, you know, we feel, whatever it is, it, it really works when I drink two cups of coffee instead of one. I, I, do, I still do stupid stuff, but I do it faster. So, you know, what, what, whatever it is, right? When we stop making it God is the, the answer, then we have problems. It's not sustainable. It leads to suffering. It leads to, to having other things ahead of God, which, which takes us right into that whole process of, of spiritual whoredom. I put other things before, before God. No, put nothing before God. Put God first. Start your day with God. You got a big day ahead of you before your feet hit the floor. Just say, God, I just I give you my day. I can't do this on my own. I need your help, God. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. I need your power. God, I need to feel your love. I need your peace. Give it to God and, and build that relationship. What he wants is an intimate relationship with you. And that doesn't come from you finding solutions everywhere else. It doesn't come from you looking everywhere else for, for the help that you want or need. I heard about this, this program. I'm going to go try this program and see how this works for whatever it is. Job, finance, addiction, whatever. I heard about this. I heard about that. You know, the number one thing you need to do is you need to go to God. Say, God, I need you every hour, every day, every minute, God, I need you. And when we do that, when we, when we allow him to husband us in life, be our source, be our cover, be our provision, we can endure and do the things that we need to do, and God will bless us. And we will be his people, and we will have his mercy. And believe me, we need his mercy more than you can even imagine. And that's it for this week. Mm -hmm.